Hello, hello! This is part two of a video series where I'm sharing my concept for a sort of dream Pokémon game. Last time we went over the very basics of the region and explained everything about the starter Pokémon. Very important Pokémon for sure, but the next most important Pokémon are the legendaries. Especially the box legendaries. And that is what this video is all about. Pokémon Blazing Bloom and Frigid Fall brings you to the Cascade region. A region based on the Pacific Northwest, like Washington and Oregon, and then you overlay them on top of each other, pull in a bit of the surrounding areas too, and there's your region! So whatever the box legendaries are, they should definitely be fitting of the area, much more so than the starters, and much more so than the other Mon as well. On top of this, they need to fit whatever the gimmick of the game is, and the lore of it all. And so here's all that context that you need to know for these legendaries. The idea in this game is that the weather in the region is absolutely ridiculous due to the rapid shifting of the seasons. Remember how seasons worked in Unova? Every real world month the season would change for the whole region. But the real world month is a gameplay mechanic thing rather than saying that's how seasons actually work there. Like how for instance loads of open world games have a day last like 20 minutes? That's not saying days literally last 20 minutes in their world, it's sped up for the sake of gameplay. It's symbolic. But in the Cascade region, uh, that's how it actually works. The region is always experiencing every season at once in each quadrant, and they rotate as the legendaries roam, sort of orbiting the mountain in the middle. This idea is fitting, as the weather in the Pacific Northwest is absolutely ridiculous. Heck, just yesterday it was hailing in the morning, and then it was 90 degrees in the evening! In fact, right next to us is the area that has the world record for the greatest 24-hour temperature change in the world. A change of 103 degrees in under 24 hours. Holy butts! Plus, there are just several different biomes here, and a big river, a big mountain range, it's just perfectly cut up into quarters already. And with this, the idea for the legendaries came. The seasons. But how do you turn Pokémon representations of the four seasons and turn that into lore and designs? Well, here we go. But first... Well... Here goes nothing. A fun fact! Did you know that two-thirds of dudes will experience some level of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? This is my dad, so I am very aware of this. And so too are the people behind Keeps.com, today's sponsor. They are all about helping you keep your beautiful locks by getting to the root of the problem ahead of the curl. In the past, you'd have to visit a doctor's office to treat hair loss, and given the pandemic right now, that's an even hairier situation. But with Keeps, you get a specialized doctor online and get FDA-approved hair loss medication delivered right to your door for a competitively low price. And of course, as with any preventative measure, the sooner you start, the more hair you'll save. So go see for yourself why they have more 5-star reviews than any of their competitors, and why over 100,000 men trust in Keeps. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to Keeps.com slash Loxton, or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Loxton, and go into middle agehood with a crowning achievement. My dad still carries an old comb with him. He just can't part with it. All right, Professor Fur. Rum Menzi's theory about the land here again? Well, to keep it short, long ago, back when what we now call fossil Pokémon still roamed the planet, this land didn't actually exist. It was instead merely a part of the vast ocean to the west, and according to myth, a giant bird of thunder flew across the area, followed by a behemoth under its command. That behemoth expanded the land from the east and created what we now call the Cascade region. Professors in other regions have since confirmed that the behemoth spoken about was a primal form of Groudon, and that the Cascade region is likely the last bit of land it ever created. But we've still yet to identify what the giant bird of thunder is. Or if it even exists. And it's not one of the Zapdos? Hmm, well, we don't know much about it, but we do know that it wasn't Zapdos, a bird of lightning. Big difference. Anyway, this new land was smoldering and hot, as new land always is. It attracted a lot of fire and rock type Pokemon, and eventually, a powerful, fiery Pokemon wandered here from the south the legendary Manadza. It took a liking to the new land, and rather than continue traveling, it took residence here. 
and its heat locked the region in a near-eternal summer, which was to its liking. It stayed here in this region for millions of years, though as it aged it grew tired and decided to hibernate in the volcano to rest and regain its heat. But in its absence, the region began to cool ever more, and eventually from the north, another legendary Pokémon meandered into the region, Arctogield. And with its arrival, it brought along a downpour of snow and ice. It is what caused the entire Ice Age on this continent as it traveled, which of course led to us losing many kinds of Pokémon that we can now only revive from fossils and glaciers now. And having the dark heart that it did, it cared not for those losses, completely unconcerned, as it took a liking to the cold. But when it found the Cascade region eventually, it grew fond of it. It loved the beauty of this land. The mountains, valleys, rivers, and forests were the best it had ever seen. And so, it too took residence here, but locked the region in a nigh-eternal winter. The surviving heat and dryness-loving Pokémon were forced to leave, or perish unable to handle the harshest of winters, and in their place came many cold and wet-loving Pokémon. But many millennia later, the cold eventually penetrated the volcano and sent a chill up Manadza's spine. It woke up and looked at what was once its territory in disgust. It hated the cold and began melting the ice in its vicinity until its part of the region was once again locked in a near-eternal summer. But its job wasn't done. It wouldn't rest until the ice was out of its region entirely. So it moved to the next area to melt the ice there. But from another mountaintop, Arctogield noticed that a part of its region had warmed. And this warmth was leaking into another part. To put an end to this, it began traveling to this area to spread its winter once more. And thus, their rivalry began. Both legendary Pokémon wish for full control of this land they call home, but neither is powerful enough to fully defeat the other. And so, one of them eventually blessed a Chumunk with great power to become a scout for it, to prepare the next quadrant for their arrival. The other liked the idea and followed suit. This led to Tamunk and Temunk, essentially deities of spring and autumn. And ever since, our region has been a seasonal anomaly in the world. Our seasons change rapidly, circling the volcano. At any given time, we experience all four seasons in different parts of the region. A blessing and a curse, really. We can grow seasonal crops all year round when the rest of the world has to wait, meaning during their off-season, we can export at a high price, but only the crops that grow fast enough to beat the next seasonal change. There are loads of tourist destinations here, ski resorts, summer beaches, ice fishing, and river rapid runs, but only when the season is correct in the right area, but there is always something somewhere. And thus, compared to most other regions, the Cascade region is an economic powerhouse. Home of Amazol, the richest corporation in the world, and of course, many flourishing smaller businesses. And at the core, we have these four Pokémon to thank for it. But despite the astounding number of people that have moved here, we still only occasionally see these Pokémon. Occasional reports and occasional photos, they somehow avoid most human contact. But still, every time we get a new photo, I simply feel awe. How these and other legendary Pokémon live so long is still unknown. And I can't even imagine a life of eternal circling around the same region, rotating the seasons and nothing else. I feel like I'd quite literally go stir-crazy. I guess that's just one of the great mysteries of Pokémon. <clears throat> Alright, back out of character now. That's the background lore of the region which is relevant to the legendaries, so now let's cover some basics about them, and then get into the real myths and legends that inspired them. So, speaking of the real world now, the west coast of the United States and Canada is fairly recent in terms of, uh, land mass in the grand scheme of things. Most of it was underwater during the time of the dinosaurs, which is why we have nearly no dinosaur fossils. Which of course means that while the rest of the world was already doing its whole existing thing, this land was still rising. Or in Pokémon's case, being created by Groudon. Which felt perfect for the idea of Manadza migrating and finding this new land and then living in it. Migration and immigration is a huge theme in the whole game concept, and this is where it all started in the Cascade region. Uh, but anyway, this is Manadza. It is a western fence lizard, locals of the area, crossed with a bit of a hadrosaur, because a hadrosaur fossil is the only fossil found in Oregon thus far. Granted, it was one of these hadrosaurs, not the iconic one, but, you know, eh, we're using the iconic one. So you take all those, and you throw on a ton of fire, because it's a pyromancer. Full on, a pyromancer. It even has a flaming feather headdress, like how dinosaurs had feathers, you know? And how the native peoples of the area had them. 
So, it's an ancient fire psychic pyromancer lizard chief, essentially. I wanted the legends of the region to reflect real ones in various Native American cultures of the area, both because, well, as far as people go, they were here first, and it just works. The Japanese Pokemon regions reference plenty of Japanese legends, Galar's got Beowulf and King Arthur mythos stuff, Kalos has Norse and other old-timey European things, you know? But also because, as I said, a big theme of this game is migration and immigration and the things we gain and lose due to it. And man, that was drilled into my head every single year in elementary school. Oh, and I live here, by the way, so. But like with any culture that's not your own, just treat it with respect. Your well-researched works can reference them and be inspired by them all you want. Intent is the biggest factor in determining appropriation or not. But I can argue about how dumb people are on the far ends of either belief are for days, so let's move on. So, the feather headdress on Manadza is a reference mainly to the Paiute people, as the northern Paiute were nomadic, thus the wandering of Manadza. And their territory ranged from the bulk of Nevada all the way up to eastern Oregon. And the western fence lizard is the one that happens to live in this part of Oregon. It, it's just good. It works. The name pulls from a few things, and I looked up pronunciation guides, but still, apologies if I messed some of these up a bit. The first part is easy, though. Mana, sometimes called mana. It's the magical energy of the earth, since it's a pyromancer. Lizard is there, obviously, as well as Tabadza, the Numu word for lizard. Numu being the language spoken by the Paiute. And also, their word for summer is Tadza. And on top of this, Manawe means a long time or forever. Essentially, this name translates to eternal magical summer lizard. It's a wizard lizard, and I love that. Oh, also it has the alchemic symbol for calcination on its chest and claws. Calcination being fancy talk for the process of heating things up a lot. I gotta fit alchemy in here somehow. Now, Arcto Yield. Arcto Yield was significantly harder to name. <sighs> Nothing quite worked. Arcto Yield was the best I could come up with, but I'm not 100% happy with it. But here's what it means and what it is. The Arctodus is a now extinct Ice Age bear. It was very large and compared to modern bears had much longer limbs and a much flatter face. Plus, it already has Arcto in the name, so Arctic. It's great. And then I remembered that it's actually the other way around, really. The Arctic and Antarctica literally mean has bears and does not have bears. Well, it also has Ark, as in a high position, like a king, so that's good too. It is a big, mean bear. Ice Dark type. Winter is almost always portrayed as a sort of bad guy in media and myths alike. Which makes sense. The cold brings harsh winters and death. Having its furry fur be mainly furry on its back is a reference to bear pelts, and the rest of its body is covered in a hard, icy armor. And this symbol on its chest is reminiscent of the alchemic symbol for congelation. Fancy talk for freezing, or rather it's used in the process of freezing, but whatever. The name also pulls from yield, which means to give, as it gives the cold. It brought the ice age, expanded the arctic, and so you gotta be really cautious around it. Yield to it, obviously. But it also pulls a bit from the Siksika word for winter, stoi. So it's a cold king bear. Neat! So get this, there is a Siksikan tale about a bear that steals the winds that bring warm air, which of course causes the land to get stuck in winter. It's pretty spot on, and plenty of other nearby regions had similar tales, like those from the Chinook. We have loads of things named after the Chinook these days too. A river, a helicopter, a salmon, and the Chinook wind is the breeze responsible for the crazy weather that we have in the Pacific Northwest. Just like how the arrival of Arcto Yield is what caused all the crazy seasons and weather to start happening in Cascade. Before then, it was just locked in summer, a big desert. You know? Tomunk and Temunk are their scouts or sidekicks, which, which works as a description for spring and autumn, really. Summer and winter are the big ones. The others are just the transition periods. Chumunk is a simple, normal-type chipmunk Pokémon. It's the Sentret, or Young Goose, of the region. And at some point, two of them were blessed and became Tamunk and Temunk. So this is cool. The Monk comes from Chipmunk, clearly. But Ta and Te? Well, Ta comes from the Paiute word for sun, Taba, or even their word for spring, Tamano. Whereas the Te comes from the Chinookan word for autumn, Mosh Tepso, literally falling leaf. They are ghost grass and fairy grass type, and I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory. Tomunk flies ahead of Manadza to prepare the land for its arrival. It gives the flowers and plants there a head start on their growth and blooming thanks to its fairy-like connection to nature. Temunk floats ahead of Arcto Yield, preparing the land for its arrival. It commands the trees and plants to kill off their leaves with its ghostly grass powers. And as a set of four, I think they symbolize the seasons perfectly when you look at their type... try... their type square. 
Type square. Yeah, it's a square now because there's four, not three. Fire Psychic versus Ice Dark. They are both super effective against each other and resistant to each other. Heck, Arcto Yield is immune to Monadza's psychic attack because it has entropy on its side. And that's super dark when you think about it. And the chipmunks also work. Both being grass, the fire and ice of summer and winter are super effective against both of them. But then the fairy of spring is strong against the dark of winter, whereas the ghostly demise of autumn is strong against the lively body heat of summer. So their type triangle square looks like this, essentially. All is balanced as it should be. Speaking of, this whole rivalry that they have with each other is inspired by a tale from the Paiute that other nations would adopt in some of their own tales as well. It is the story of how the seasons came to be. And long story short, <clears throat> Wolf calls a meeting. All of the animals come together to discuss the weather and what they should do about it. But they didn't invite Coyote because nobody likes Coyote. He is a know-it-all, a smart aleck, a prick. So the animals got to debating, and Grizzly Bear said, It should be cold all the time because I have long fur, and when it's cold, the rivers are full of fish, and I like fish. But then the lizards and snakes said they hated that idea. They would freeze to death. No, it should be hot all the time so they can relax in the sun. Bear and the other long-furred animals hated that idea. They would basically melt. So lots of debating happened, and it went for a long, long time. Even after the meeting, lots of conflict was had. And then, eventually, Coyote caught wind of this and was like, Oh, hey, guys, you're all stupid. Just invent seasons. And everybody soon realized that that was a very good idea. But they hated that it came from Coyote. But they did it anyway. And that is how the seasons came to be. So, Winter Bear versus Summer Lizard. And Wise Old Coyote saves the day. Oh yeah, so here's Wikoot, a wise old coot coyote who is a bit wicked. In most Native American tales, Coyote is portrayed as a trickster, a prankster. It knows a lot, and it's a jerk about it. So, it is a psychic dark type mythical. Now then, as far as stats and abilities go, Arcto Yield is all in with its physical attack and physical defense, and Manadza is the same with special attack and special defense. It sounds like they'd kill each other pretty quick until you consider their abilities. The first special attack launched at Arcto Yield per battle is reflected back at the attacker for free. It essentially tanks it out with its reflective armor. And that blown off bit of icy armor then starts up some windy hail. Likewise, the first physical attack at Manadza is countered. Essentially, the attacking Mon gets lost in the heat waves and smoke and flames after Manadza dodges, and now it's hurt by the fire that was in its place. And in the process of this, it begins a windy drought. Tamunk and Temunk then are pretty even overall. They're, they're balanced. And their abilities each trigger a weather condition upon leaving the Pokeball. Pollinated air or cursed winds. Two new weathers that will be explained in the weather video. Signature moves. Wildfire has Minadza cast multiple fireballs all around it, damaging the enemy team and starting fires on the battlefield, removing previously existing weather conditions and causing a smoky drought. Whiteout has Arcto Yield charge forward while summoning a glacier wall behind it which explodes on impact, damaging the enemy team, removing previously existing weather conditions, and replacing it with a snowy hailstorm. Efflorescence causes Tamunk to grow flowers all around it and its allies, healing just them a bit right now and allowing everyone on the battlefield to heal a little bit each turn. More so if the sun is out, and more so if the Pokémon is fairy or grass type. Languishing Aura causes Temunk to summon a ghostly sensation of withering on the enemy's side of the battlefield, causing them to experience minor damage now, and then everyone on the battlefield continues to take minor damage each turn. More so if the air is cursed, and less so to not at all if they are dark or ghost type. Oh yeah, and Wikoot! Might as well explain my ideas for the mythical as well. So Wikoot is a wise old trickster, so it needs a tricky gimmick, right? Well, its ability, Neutralize, functions similarly to Galarian Weezing's Neutralizing Gas, where all Pokémon abilities do not trigger while it's out, except it will also nullify all weather effects when it reaches half HP. Fun! Its stats are interesting. It's much slower than most and doesn't have the best HP, 
but it makes up for it with an interesting new move. Potentially not a signature though, as I could see others utilizing it well too. Uh, Hoodwink is a priority move that swaps the user's special and physical stats. It lets them adapt to the situation and potentially bamboozle some foes. And its actual signature move, Horn Swangle, has it act like a victim. You wouldn't hurt an old coot, would you? Which sharply lowers the foe's attack and special attack. Aw oh man, the power creep! I feel like these work well with the trickster idea. So on top of all this, I'd like mythical Pokemon to also be like some legendary Pokemon. Too many Pokemon these days are just given to us. I remember when legendary and mythical Pokemon had events in game where you had to get them or like explore a cave or some island you know something neat anything's better than just oh hey here you have it now or oh you entered a code here's a battle catch it with a quick ball and you know I, I want that back I, I want to get the good stuff back so in this case here's here's my idea being a mythical it would still have a real world event like a giveaway thing but all it would do is make wakut appear in one of the three wild areas you know which wild area but it's always wandering and changing basically i want it to be like the old legendary beasts where it will also try to run away the whole time maybe even at one point pretend to be caught you are now in the overworld you take one step and oh nope he left he got out huh wouldn't that be hilarious to people who don't know it's a thing? Ha! Huh. It only does that once, though. The second time you catch it, it's yours. Now, uh... So... Uh, yeah, that, that's them. Uh, that is the lore and design behind the box legendaries, plus the bonus mythical. What they do while playing the game and how they interact with the evil team and you and everything is being saved for the plot video. And I know you'll love it. Thanks so much for watching. Next time we'll go into some other just regular Pokemon my ideas for them. They're all themed after the region, and it's great. You'll love it. So until then, never stop using your noggin, and check out the artist's Instagram. Link is below. And also consider supporting us on Patreon, because that is how we commission all of the artists involved in this project. Thanks, bye.